I, I didn't um, plan on being a widow at the age of 38. Look what he took away from us. It gets harder and harder each time we have to do this. You know, it, it would be different if it was like every 10 years, but it's anywhere from three to five years. And it gets tiring having to conjure it all up and regurgitate it. You know, you get tired of having to go through all of this stuff of, of requesting letters, um, posting things on different sites, and wondering if it'll ever be enough, you know, to keep him there. We have to do everything we can to keep him in prison. Sue Lang. She's fought the last 35 years to keep her husband's killer in prison. Yet, he's up for another parole review hearing, or life sentence review hearing, as they're called in Minnesota. The hearing is on April 11th. Sue and her son need our help. They need your help. We have until March 28th to have our voices heard. So after this story, we'll let you know how you can help the Lang family and keep this cop killer in prison. The Greg Lang Story, Revisited, is brought to you by our friends at Law Enforcement Labor Services in Minnesota. Law Enforcement Labor Services, also known as LELS, is Minnesota's largest public safety labor union with over 7,000 Minnesota public safety members serving in all areas of public safety. Law enforcement, 911 dispatch centers, corrections, public safety administrative support personnel, and firefighters. Established in 1977, LELS serves over 260 different public safety agencies and over 450 locals across the state of Minnesota. With their administration, general counsel, three staff attorneys, and 14 business agents, LALS provides contract negotiations for better wages and benefits, grievance processing and representation, discipline representation, mediation and arbitration, assistance with representation for post-board hearings, and in-line-of-duty death benefits for survivor families. Find out more about Law Enforcement Labor Services at LELS.org. LELS.org. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Scott Rose. I'm currently the sheriff with the Dodge County Sheriff's Office in Southeast Minnesota. And I'm your host for today's new episode of the Officer Down Memorial Podcast. In each episode of the Officer Down Memorial Podcast, we'll share the details and the stories of how these men and women heroically lost their lives in the line of duty. Our mission is to help ensure their service and their sacrifice is never forgotten. Thanks for spending some time with me today to remember and honor these fallen heroes. Gregory Lynn Lang. Locals all knew him as Greg. Originally from Sutherland, Iowa, he lived with his wife Sue and his son Chris in the small southeastern Minnesota town of Claremont. Located about 34 miles west of Rochester, Claremont was a, a quiet farming community along State Highway 14, located on the west side of Dodge County. George H. W. Bush was in a battle with Democrat candidate Michael Dukakis for the White House. Read my lips. No... New taxes. Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise starred in their new hit movie, Rain Man. Driveway. There's only 28 miles on the odometer since I drove it a week ago last Saturday. It should be more than 28 miles. What is this? Who is this guy? In southern Minnesota, it had been a pretty rough spring. A series of three tornadoes that killed three people and lots of storms that year. The year was 1988. The times were much different back then. Back in 1988, we had no internet, so there was no emails, there was no um, Facebook, there was no cell phones. At that time, Dodge County had just over 15,000 people living there among six different cities. The largest city was Casson, with 3,500 people. Claremont was the smallest community with just over 500 people. 
Their small local high school mascot was the parrot. Their colors were orange and black, and all the kids knew and liked the town police chief, Greg Lang. It was Independence Day, 1988. According to Greg's wife, Sue, Greg was off that night and they had been out. Weekend, and it was a long weekend, and we had actually been out of town and had come home, um, got home probably about 7 o'clock. All the fireworks shows were done for the night, and fireworks were all illegal in Minnesota at the time, but, but there were many in Claremont known to party and to potentially cause problems. Independence Day was certainly no exception to this in Claremont. Greg had gone to check reports and uh, had come home and said, had mentioned that there had been some issues at the home um, across, it's across the street and towards the back of uh, the alley. And so I went ahead to bed because I was supposed to get up and go to work the next morning. When Greg accepted the chief's job in Claremont, he knew he was accepting a law enforcement position in what was a deeply divided community at that time. There were many residents that were outspoken and anti-law enforcement. He worked really hard to, to show all the residents that, that he was willing to listen to their concerns and to work out resolutions that were in the best interest of the community and, and still enforce the law. He showed that he cared. And he had a vested interest in that community, and he, and he really did earn their trust. He wanted all the residents to know that he was trying to make Claremont a safer community, and that they could come to him anytime, anytime, day or night, if they needed help. Greg adored his son Chris, who was 12 years old at the time. He coached Little League Baseball as another way to spend quality time with Chris, quality time that often his job took away. He was a natural magnet for the kids in Claremont. They, they all knew him. They trusted him. They knew they could go to him for help or, or even come to his home after school if their parents were gone and they didn't want to be home alone. His door was always open for the kids in Claremont that needed it. Raleigh Spriggle was the Dodge County Sheriff's deputy that was on duty that night. I think I was the only one working that particular shift, and Jensen came on the later part of the shift, and I was going to be going off duty, and he was coming on, and it, it happened just before the end of my shift. It was 2 a.m., and Greg was home and heard a knock on the door. It was Rebecca Bermia, a local gal from town, who said she needed him to go to the residence of her sister, Yesenia Ortega, and her boyfriend, Andrew Salinas. Rebecca said Andrew had been pistol-whipping Yesenia while she was holding their five-month-old baby girl. Andrew also shot two rounds in the ceiling while they were arguing. Rebecca, who'd been listening from outside the house, had heard Andrew say that he was going to take Yesenia out to a cornfield and he was going to kill her. Claremont was one of three cities back in 1988 that had their own police departments in Dodge County. They had one part-time officer who typically worked when Greg was not working. Their primary backup for the police department was the Dodge County Sheriff's Office, which was run at the time by Sheriff Ernie Vanderhyde. The Sheriff's Office was a small, typical rural county office. At night, they had one deputy on, they had one 911 dispatcher, and they didn't have a jail. The county had always paid neighboring counties for jail space. Actually, they're still one of probably a half dozen counties that still do that today in Minnesota. With small communities like this in Minnesota, officers often wore many hats. Dodge County investigator Kurt Uppadal, who was third in command behind the chief deputy and the sheriff, was off duty from the sheriff's office, was also an EMT, and he was working part-time for the local ambulance service that night. I was on a medical in Dodge Center at the senior high-rise building, and Raleigh was there with me, and we had an extremely heavy-set lady, and I only had two female attendants with me. And so I had asked Raleigh to help me down the stairs, you know, with this lady, because we didn't have elevator. And at that point, Greg called in.
Chief Lang radioed to dispatch that he was 10-8, and he was going to a 1079, which is a domestic disturbance. He indicated there was a gun involved, and he drove Rebecca there in his squad. When he got to their house, he saw Andrew Salinas walking out of the house holding a gun to Yesenia's head. She was still holding the baby. Chief Lang identified himself, and he stepped in to separate Andrew from Yesenia and the baby. His immediate response to the Salinas house, without waiting for backup, without concern for his own safety, it certainly saved lives that night. By the time we got downstairs, dispatch had gotten the call that they were fighting and that the girl had gotten away and the fight was going on between Andrew and Greg. Yesenia was able to get away with the baby and then run to her parents' home about two blocks away where a second call was placed to 911. One of them got away and went over to her her parents' house, called the sheriff's office. And in the meantime, uh, Greg was facing the two brothers alone. I, I need I need some help down to Karma very quick. There's a city. Who am I speaking to? Yes, I need a ticket. Okay, isn't there an officer there? Huh? Is there an officer there now? Yeah. Well, can you hear me up, please? Can I speak to the officer that's there? He's not here. Okay, what's your address? Huh? What is your address? Because he's, he's beating up the cops. Who is? My husband. What is your address? 207 Main Street. 207 Main Street. Yeah. Can I hear you up in emergency, please? Okay, I'll get somebody over there as quick as I can. Yeah, Harry, please, bye. Back in Dodge Center, Kurt couldn't leave the medical. The girls couldn't drive the ambulance, so I had to drive it to take the patient to Rochester Hospital. Before this night, Kurt and Raleigh had never had contact with the Salinas brothers. They had moved to Minnesota earlier that year from Lubbock, Texas. The brothers had a, a history of heavy drinking. The sheriff's office had contact with Andrew back in June involving an assault with a knife in Dodge Center. Andrew had also been previously charged with murder in Texas in an incident where he'd been shot. This was three to four years prior to this. Those charges were dropped. I had not had contact with him uh, that I could remember. Uh, I know that Greg had had problems with him, but he always was able to talk to him and, you know, they did what he asked. But this particular night, they were pretty well intoxicated and, and their two girlfriends, the Ortega sisters, uh, were goofing around on them and uh, doing things that pissed the boys off. Greg and Andrew wrestled around the entryway of the house. Robert Salinas, Andrew's brother, said he was sleeping on the couch and then woke up. He later stated he didn't know who was fighting with his brother, so he charged both of them to separate them and was able to push Chief Lang out the door where he fell backwards down the steps. Greg pulled his gun. Robert grabbed a shovel that was propped up by the steps and hit Greg numerous times in the head, arm, and shoulder, causing him to drop his gun. Andrew then picked up the gun, and he shot him. The bullet entered under Greg's right arm and into his shoulder. At this point, Rebecca Bermia, who was still watching behind the bushes, ran to her parents' home and placed a third call to 911. In his statement made to law enforcement and in his trial testimony, Robert said he'd gone inside the house to put his shoes on when he heard a second shot. Richard Toon was the Dodge County dispatcher that night. Rich Toon called me on the radio and said that he had 1033 traffic, that we had an officer down and shots fired. Raleigh, who was still helping Kurt at the medical, took off to help Greg. He was 10 miles east of Claremont. Raleigh took off. I recall his radio transmission says he was going across from Dodge Center to Claremont. I can't get any more speed out of this thing. It won't go any faster. 
dispatch had gotten calls saying that Greg was injured and he was down and Rollick was just uh, pushing it as hard as he could. Actually, uh, Jim Jensen and I both got there at the same time. And the reason for it, I was driving the new Chevy and I uh, been running the air conditioner and that dang thing. And it was just like the engine was uh, had exploded and it kept backfiring through the uh, carburetor. And the top speed on the Chevy at that time was 80 miles an hour. Robert went back outside where he helped his brother go through Chief Lang's pockets. They took the money from his wallet and they took the keys out of his pockets. And he and Andrew dragged Greg under some bushes in the alley and then and then they fled in his police car. Deputy Jim Jensen was just coming on shift to relieve Raleigh around the time of the call. Both Raleigh and Jim arrived in Claremont at the same time and found Chief lying on the ground behind the house. By the time we got over to Claremont, we got into the alley and Jim uh, parked further to the east and I was to the west. And uh, I I got out of my car and I almost stepped in bed. He was laying alongside of the alley uh, face down. Raleigh said he could hardly recognize Greg due to his injuries from the beating with the shovel. I had just gotten my National Register EMT license. And I'm looking down at Greg, and I don't know if he said it or not, but something about Dr. Kildor, don't let, don't let me die. And I, I don't, I'll never forget that because of the fact I'd just gotten that stupid license. And so I was checking him and trying to figure out what was wrong. And I found that he'd been shot, and there was no way I could control the bleeding on the inside. Raleigh checked and found Greg had a weak pulse, but he wasn't breathing. Raleigh started mouth-to-mouth and gave Greg two breaths. Greg started to breathe, but then he stopped again. Raleigh continued to do what he could until the ambulance arrived. Respond to 207 North Main Street, Ortega Residence. Possible shooting incident. Three officers at the scene respond immediately. They'd requested Mail 1 to respond to help Greg. Mail 1 is an emergency medical helicopter. It's dispatched from St. Mary's Hospital in Rochester, approximately 30 miles east of Claremont in Olmsted County. The crew, the medical equipment, and the medications on board Mayo One make them a mobile emergency department, or an ED, equipped to handle nearly anyone with serious trauma injuries or a critical illness. Mayo One can be in flight within minutes of dispatch, 24 hours a day, every day of the week. Mayo Clinic medical helicopters like Mayo One fly nearly 2,000 flights a year. Raleigh and Dodge County Sheriff Ernie Vanderhyde went to Greg's house to notify his wife, Sue, that Greg was hurt. I went to bed and didn't hear a thing until I heard pounding on the door. And um, here was one of the Dodge County deputies that was at the door. And I opened it up, and because it wasn't unusual to see somebody at the door. And I said, well, Greg's not here. And he said, I know. And that's when he backed me into the house and sat me down to tell me that Greg had been hurt. Yeah, it was me. Yeah, it was sure, Vanderhyde uh, came be- up behind me and he says, well, you know Sue better than I do. You go over there and tell her what happened and tell her to be ready and I'll, I'll transport her to St. Mary's. I went over and knocked on the door and Sue came to the door and she says, Rally, what's going on? I said, I don't know. I said, Greg has been hurt very, very bad. They're flying him to St. Mary's in Rochester. Ernie's going to be here in just a couple of minutes, and you need to go with him and go to the hospital to be there when Greg gets there. Greg was in critical condition and was transported to St. Mary's Hospital in Rochester by mail one. Matter of fact, as he was flying, Ernie and Sue were in Ernie's squad car running on Highway 14 following the uh, helicopter on land. The, 
the EMTs at the scene, the doctors, and the nurses at St. Mary's did everything they could to save Greg. Chief Lang was pronounced dead at 3.40 a.m. in Rochester. Greg died of numerous skull fractures, a gunshot to his shoulder, and a point-blank gunshot to his back. It was unbel- It was something that we could. I couldn't quite wrap my head around as to what actually happened, how badly he was hurt. And by the time we got to the um, hospital, and when the doctors were talking to us and said that he had died, I said, he died? I mean, I just had no clue as to how serious he had been injured. Chief Gregory Lang was 39 years old. He began his law enforcement career in Owatonna, Minnesota, with the police department there. He was there from 1972 until 1979. He became chief in Claremont in March of 1986. After the county was notified of Greg's death, Kurt was then sent as the lead investigator to the hospital. The sheriff sent me down to be in the autopsy room when, while they were doing the autopsy uh, on Greg to retrieve any evidence so that was there. Collecting the evidence at the autopsy was important to maintain the integrity of the evidence for their case against the Salinas brothers. Back in Claremont, a large group of cops, deputies, and troopers from across the area gathered at the Claremont Fire Hall on Front Street. Steel County Sheriff Bill Hildebrandt had also arrived to assist. In Minnesota, the motto is simple among its 87 sheriffs. No sheriff stands alone. It was time to find the Salinas brothers. With Chief Lang's police car, the brothers headed south and ended up in a cornfield just off Minnesota State Highway 30 about 12 miles south of Claremont. Bill Hildebrandt, the sheriff out of uh, Steele County, showed up at Claremont, and we were in the fire hall at that time. And then Weber showed up, and... Bill Weber was the Dodge County Sheriff's chief deputy. And uh, Bill Hildebrandt said, Raleigh, how do you want to run it? And I said, we got to check between County Road 3 and... Uh, or County Road 5, rather, and and County Road 1, because somewhere in there, that squad car is going to be because they stole his squad car. And so Hildebrandt told me that we should go from 218 in his county to County Road 5 in our county. And I agreed with it. So we had troopers and uh, Steele County deputies, uh, uh, Dodge County deputies, uh, and I, I the Owatonna, not uh, Owatonna, yeah, I think Owatonna had some peace officers over there also. And we started looking for the squad car. The car was finally located down on Highway 30 in the S curves, straight uh, north of the Peterson farm. And it was out in the field, way out in the field. Minnesota State Patrol sent a helicopter and a fixed-wing plane to help with the search. The helicopter located Greg's police car in a field at about 6.30 a.m. When I got down to the car, we started looking it over, and Scott McConkey, who was a state trooper with us at that time, met me, and we started looking in the woods and the buildings around, looking to see if they were still there or if they had uh, fled and you know, stole on a vehicle somewhere. At that time, we didn't find anything, and as the night grew into morning, we had the intersection of that uh, 30 and that township road that runs past the King Camp coming back to Claremont. We had that uh, sealed off, and we were waiting for BCA to get there to do the crime scene of the car. 
The BCA is the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. It's a statewide criminal investigative bureau under the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. Most agencies in Minnesota back then didn't have the equipment, the manpower, or the technical training to, to really fully investigate homicides. The BCA provides expert forensic scientists. They provide criminal investigation services to help agencies all across the state investigate homicides and other major crimes. At that point, we found Greg's shotgun laying in the ditch, and uh, we picked that up, photographed it, picked it up, and so forth. Kept that for evidence, and Don uh, Peterson Sr., who lived right on the intersection there by the Westville Town Hall, uh, came up and he says, I got to talk to somebody, I got to talk to somebody. And at first, the deputies didn't want to let him through, but Finally, I stood out and I heard him saying, Don, come on over here, I'll talk to you. So he came over and he started talking to me and he told me that his son's car had been stolen out of his yard. Don Peterson didn't have the license plate number of his son's stolen vehicle. He gave me a description of the car, but we didn't have the license number. At that point, I got a hold of uh, the county attorney's office to ask them, if Don Sr. could sign a stolen report for me because Don Jr. was out on uh, a run with the semis that the Petersons owned down there. And the county attorney said, yes, that was permissible. So I had Sr. sign my stolen report. And I called back to the office. At this time, Weber was in the office. And I told him that we needed to put out a national broadcast with that license number. Well, the problem was that they couldn't get the number out of uh, DOT, so we had to get a hold of Don Peterson's insurance agent and have him give us the license number off from the policy that uh, he had with Junior. Once we got the policy number, got the license number off the policy, we uh, I ran that through DMV and they came back to all the information we needed, and we put out a national broadcast, special attention, Interstate 35, from Minnesota to Texas. I had talked to some of their relatives earlier, and they said that the two brothers would probably run for home. Teletypes, also known as teleprinters, were typewriters that they'd used to send out messages over non-switched telephone circuits the public telephone network to printers at the receiving agency. The BCA would receive the information on their printer, review the request, and then they'd send out a teletype warning to all law enforcement agencies in the requested area. The process we use today is still very similar. However, it's all done now over the internet. After sending out the bulletin, Dodge County got notified by Missouri State Patrol. A Missouri State Highway Patrolman indicated that he had just received that information on the radio and acknowledged it and hung his mic up. Looked across the freeway at the traffic coming south and thought he seen the car, what they described. He, without making a big ruckus, made a turn and got on the other side going south and sure and behold, he got up close enough to read the license plate, and it did. Now, how much distance he followed them, he, that I don't ever know. I've never asked that. But it had to be a while because once he identified that he had the vehicle in front of him, they started putting a program together and selected the rest stop that they closed Interstate 35 and made every vehicle go up through the rest stop. And they had snipers on top of the bathhouse. They had other troopers in there. And they, they went right up in there. And, of course, at that point, the troopers got them out. And the gun, Greg's gun, was being was in the passenger seat 
one of them was sitting on the gun in the passenger seat. It was Greg Scott. The troopers got them out of the car, got them arrested, and took them up to the jail. The highway patrolman got to interview him and was able to identify them, was able to identify the car as the stolen car, also identify great stuff. Robert and Andrew were arrested by the Missouri State Patrol about 10.30 a.m. that morning on I-35 north of Kansas City in Clinton County, Missouri, approximately 350 miles south of Claremont. Sheriff Ernie Vanderhyde sent Deputy Raleigh Spriggle, Investigator Kurt Uppadall, my dad, Deputy Bob Rose, and Community Service Officer Roger Hansen to Missouri in two vehicles to bring the Salinas brothers back to Minnesota. The prosecuting attorney for Dodge County at the time was Joseph Wieners. Then Ernie sent myself and uh, Roger Hansen, Raleigh, and uh, your dad. And the four of us went with two cars and went down to uh, Missouri. And uh, we got down there and went into the sheriff's office and Joe Wieners had already called and left word he wanted to talk to me before I even seen the prisoners. And he call, uh, so I called him, and he says, you can't talk to him. I says, what do you mean, Joe? I can't talk to them. I says, I'll give them their Miranda rights. And I says, once I do that, if they tell me they don't want to talk, that's fine. I says, but till then, I can talk. He says, no. The court has already ruled that they, uh, they have a court-appointed attorney. I says, how can they have a court-appointed attorney? They haven't been arraigned. He says, well, they do. And somehow or another, the defense attorneys that they appointed for those two guys convinced Agater that uh, they aren't going to have any money and uh, they aren't going to be able to defend themselves. So we need to make sure that that's the process we go through. In court, the Missouri State Trooper testified on behalf of the state of Minnesota against the Salinas brothers. He explained the interview he'd done with them in Missouri. In fact, he was the only law enforcement officer that had been able to talk to the Salinas brothers. His testimony, combined with the great work of Deputy Raleigh Spriggle, Investigator Kurt Uppadall, all the other officers who assisted, and the prosecuting attorney Joseph Wieners, ultimately led to Robert Salinas, age 23, pleading guilty to second-degree murder intentional, and Andrew Salinas, age 25, pleading guilty to first-degree murder. Prior to sentencing, Raleigh had really been struggling with this case, struggling with the loss of his friend. He and I and Kurt were like three uh, bees in a pod. We'd go out for meals, and I would stop over at Claremont and see... Uh, see him at his house and, and we'd go and have lunches together we were real close Raleigh told Kurt he would have to attend the sentencing on his own Raleigh just said he couldn't do it I was going to go over there and I was having so much of a problem that I, I called and I told Kurt I said I can't come in I, I gotta stay out of there and so that's what happened I stayed out and Kurt went in at the end of the sentencing hearing, before handing down their sentence, Dodge County District Court Judge Lawrence Agater paused to make a point. When he was doing the sentencing, I recall Judge Agater saying, go get me the sand shovel. And he took the sand shovel and he says, this was part of his reasoning of the sentencing. But he he raised his hands up when he says, you took this, struck Greg across the head with this, disabling him completely. Then you have the audacity to go down, take his gun, and shoot him. That part just amazed me that he, he felt that uh, much pressure 
that he wanted something to really show that what they had done was totally unnecessary. The Honorable Judge Agater accepted their pleas and sentenced Robert Salinas to a 21-year sentence, which included an upper departure from the sentencing guidelines. This upper departure was overturned by the appellate court, and his sentence stood at 18 and a half years. He would be released on parole in just 12 years. Andrew Salinas, the one who shot Greg, was sentenced to first-degree murder and received a life sentence with eligibility for parole in only 18 years. On October 5th, 2000, Robert Salinas was released on parole to the state of Texas. In April of 2002, he absconded from parole. He was arrested and he was extradited back to Minnesota. He was given a second parole hearing in July of 2003. On September 1st of 2003, he and two other parolees walked away from a halfway house in the Twin Cities and and stole a car. They were apprehended on Thursday, September 4th, while trying to enter Mexico. Robert's next release date was ordered to be October 5th, 2007, when his sentence for the murder of Chief Lang expired. He was released and returned to southeast Minnesota, where he still lives today. On June 3rd, 2002, a parole hearing for Andrew Salinas was held. A decision was rendered that Andrew would not be eligible for another parole hearing for 10 years. This is the longest decision ever handed down by the Minnesota Department of Corrections. He would remain in Stillwater State Prison until his next hearing. In 2008, Andrew and four other inmates in prison for murder attempted to dig out of the Bayport prison in Stillwater, tunneling out from the bottom of an elevator shaft. They dug out 25 feet before corrections staff discovered their tunnel in February of that year. Andrew and the others were punished with 540 days of segregated confinement. Each pled guilty to charges of aiding, advising, counseling, conspiring, attempting, or acting as an accessory to escape at the prison. According to the information released by the Corrections Department, an employee of the prison failed to notice that an electric hammer drill used in the escape attempt was missing from its storage case. Despite this oversight, an investigation led by the department's Office of Special Investigations concluded that no prison staff was involved in the attempt. According to reports, in addition to the hammer drill, Improvised tools were used by the four to dig the tunnel in the basement of one of five industrial buildings at the prison. A corrections officer discovered the tunnel at the base of one of two abandoned cargo elevators during a security inspection in February. The inmates cut a hole in a door that blocked the shaft, then they concealed the hole with a vent cover. As one inmate stood watch for corrections staff or for other inmates, Others crawled inside the shaft, using the improvised tools, the hammer drill, and electric lights, and they burrowed towards the prison's west perimeter wall. Andrew and the other three inmates disposed of excavated soil in the second elevator shaft. The tunnel, which officials described last winter as reaching within 60 feet of the wall, was filled in March. Investigators remain unsure how long the excavation had been underway, and they said the inmates, including Andrew, refused to cooperate with the investigation. Eleven years after his escape attempt on April 14, 2020, the parole board for the Minnesota Department of Corrections held another hearing for Andrew Salinas. They continued his sentence, however, they moved him to a medium security facility and they told the Lang family that he would be eligible again for another parole hearing in just three years. Greg's wife, Sue, later went on to serve with the Dodge, Fillmore, and Olmstead Community Corrections and Victim Services Advisory Boards. She was appointed by Minnesota Governor Arne Carlson as the first crime victim to serve on the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission. She served on the National Board of Concerns of Police Survivors from 1992 to 1998, serving as their national president from 94 to 96. 
served on the national board of the National Law Enforcement Memorial and was a member of the building committee for the Minnesota Law Enforcement Memorial in St. Paul. All this plus she served for 15 years at Gold Cross Ambulance and Mayo Medical Transport in Rochester. Her retirement date was October 10th, Greg's birthday. He would have been 69 years old. In addition to all the work Sue's done over the years to support fallen officers, survivor families, literally across the country, Sue made a promise to Greg when he died. She promised she would do everything in her power to make sure Andrew was never released from prison. And she continues to fight on Greg's behalf. Andrew Salinas is once again scheduled to go before the Life Sentence Review Board on April 11th, 2023 there's still time for all of us to help the Lang family. Our friends at the Officer Down Memorial page, that's odmp.org. It's a nonprofit organization dedicated to honoring America's fallen law enforcement heroes. Now, on their No Parole page, they help citizens send emails and letters to parole boards, encouraging them to deny parole to convicted cop killers. If you're interested in helping the Lang family keep Salinas in prison where he belongs, ODMP has a page dedicated to Greg where they'll help you send an email or letter to the state of Minnesota in support of the Lang family. It only takes a few minutes to do this, and it will mean the world to Sue and her family. Every letter makes a difference. Well, I, th I think when people, people don't realize how important those letters are, when I spoke with the panel and the commissioner, they told me they keep every letter Every letter is put into a binder and it goes with the record for that inmate. So if, if they think that their letters don't make a difference, they do. They do make a difference. The Life Sentence Review Board and the State Commissioner will accept letters from the public up to two weeks prior to the hearing, which means your letter needs to be sent by Tuesday, March 28th. Now, we have a link in the episode notes and on Greg's page on our website that'll help you get to ODMP's page for Greg, which will walk you through how to send your letter so you can voice your support for the Lang family. It's a simple process. Just click on the link in the notes or on Greg's page. Because of Andrew Salinas' actions, the Lang family was sentenced to life. Life without a husband, without a father, a son grandfather, uncle, life without their community leader in Claremont. We believe Andrew should serve no less time for this brutal and senseless murder, the murder of this hero, Chief Greg Lang. Thank you for your support of the Lang family and for helping us ensure Greg's service and sacrifice is never forgotten. Thank you for spending the time to listen, learn about, and honor the memory of this fallen hero. Make sure you take the time to thank your local law enforcement for their service and their sacrifice. And don't forget to thank their families too. They also sacrifice so much for our safety. It's up to us to help ensure the sacrifices made by these fallen heroes and by their families are never forgotten. So please share this podcast with family and friends. Until next time, this is the Officer Down Memorial Podcast. I'm Scott Rose. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.